With that in mind, let's go, let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Ask Him to be with us. Uh, if you've got a need, would you just lift your hand? God knows what it is. Uh, we're going to take these needs to the Lord tonight. Ask God to just be present with us. Would you join me in prayer? Would you just pray in your own way? Lord, we give you thanks today. God, we are recipients of your mercy and of your grace, God, and we would not be here now, God, if it wasn't for your power. And God, you see the needs that have walked into this house tonight, God, those, Lord, that are sick in body, God, those who have loved ones, God, who are undergoing surgery, Lord Jesus, those that are dealing with stress and anxiety in their mind, God, Lord, perhaps by things that they've not chosen for themselves, but God, it's been foisted upon them, whatever the need is. Lord, you are the God that can move and that can minister. God, you can move into every circumstance and situation. You are the God of restoration and reconciliation. You're the God of healing and deliverance. And we pray that you'd be present in all these ways in our lives tonight. God, we pray you would bless the word tonight as it is spoken. God, let it be illuminated to us. God, let us receive understanding, God, that we perhaps lack before we walked in. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. It, is, it is so wonderful uh, to continue tonight, if you remember last week, we started off the letter of Galatians that Paul wrote to the church there in Galatia. Uh, and really, all we really got through last week was in that first chapter, we really got into Paul's introduction, and then we started to get a little bit into kind of the story behind the letter. And one of the things I really like about Galatians um, is that it just reads pretty plain. You follow along what's happening quite easily. Paul, initially last week, we know that he introduced himself as an apostle, uh, and then he greeted the church, and then he began to talk to them about how he am was amazed that they were so quickly being turned away to another gospel. There were people that were came to them, and they began to preach to them Christ and something else. There's something else that's required for your salvation, but whatever was laid out by the apostles is in Christ is not enough. Now there's extra things that you got to do. And he confronted this head on and said, listen, if you listen to another gospel, I don't care if I myself come to you and preach it, then put a curse on them. Let God curse them that preached you anything else. And then he goes on to talk to them about why he's called. And he talks to them about how he was received this revelation directly from Jesus Christ, and then he went to Jerusalem, and he met Cephas, or he met Peter, and he stayed with him, and then he met James, the brother of Jesus, and that now he is saying that they were astonished that I was preaching the gospel, me, who used to persecute the church. And so we're continuing that thought on. So when you read it in chapters, uh, which chapters wasn't there when it was originally written, that breakdown in chapter and verse came down much later. It's a much more convenient way of understanding the Bible and finding where we are at the same spot. But the downside of chapter and verse is sometimes, you know, when you're in a book, you chapter ends, a new chapter begins, we're kind of used to things have shifted. Maybe time has passed. Maybe we're following a new character or a new narrative. And sometimes they'll put a chapter break right in the middle of a thought and we'll just kind of disconnect from what's going on. But Paul here is just, he's just continuing on. I went to Jerusalem for a little while, and then I did this, and then I did that. And so now he picks up in chapter 1, it says this. So this is narratively, he tells you something happened, and then he says, all right, now, then after 14 years. So he says, I went to Jerusalem, I met Peter, I met James, I went to Syria, and these people were amazed that I preached the gospel. And then 14 years later, I went again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. We heard a lesson about Barnabas uh, some months ago. Brother Tony Cotton taught us that lesson about being an encourager, Barnabas, the son of encouragement. He said, I took Barnabas with me. I took Titus along also. That's going to be important later on, the fact that he took Titus with him. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. So he says, look, 14 years have passed. I've been out doing my work. I've been out preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and I had to go back to Jerusalem. Now, if you're reading along in your Bibles, if you're 
reading in Galatians, one of the things that you can do right here is you can just thumb over to the book of Acts, and you can go to the book of Acts chapter 15, and you're going to find a telling in Acts chapter 15 of what happens when Paul goes to Jerusalem. He said, so look, I went to Jerusalem, I took Barnabas, and I took Titus with me, and I went and I met privately with those who were esteemed as leaders. I went to Jerusalem and I sat down with the leaders of the church. I sat down with the important people. I rubbed shoulders with the bigwigs and I began to speak with them. He said, and I did this for a reason because I wanted to make sure that what I had been doing, I had not been doing it in vain. Anybody ever done something and realized that just what you did was just worthless, right? Like it's just, it's just, I just wasted all that time, it's like Brother Juan, it's like pouring concrete and below freezing temperatures. You can do it. It's just, you know, not going to end well for you. Okay, like we're, we're, he said, I went to, because I wanted to make sure that what I was doing, I hadn't been doing in vain. Now, there's two possibilities here, and, but if we know Paul, we'll, we'll see one of these is probably more, more likely. One of the things is he was possibly doing is saying, I went to go and to see what they were preaching, because I wanted to make sure that what I was preaching was matching up with what they were preaching. Because if I was out of line, then I wanted to make sure I hadn't wasted my time preaching the wrong gospel. I've been talking to you about preaching the wrong gospel. I want to make sure I didn't preach the wrong gospel. The other option is that he said, I know I'm preaching the right gospel. I just wanted to make sure they were still preaching the right gospel. Now, if we know Paul, that's where my money lands. <laughs> Paul kind of always plays from the power position. Paul always comes from a place of authority. And he's a guy that knows, he knows what's up. He says, but I wanted to go and I wanted to make sure that we weren't at cross purposes with what we were teaching people. And this is going to be important here in just a second. If you read in the book of Acts chapter 15, one of the things that's taking place is there's an argument in the church. Last week, we talked about this. We talked about the fact that the church was primarily Jewish. It was Jewish believers that believed on the Messiah, and they came to believe in Jesus, and then they became Christians, but they had a Jewish foundation. The foundation was the law and the prophets. The foundation was the Torah. The foundation was the Levitical law. That was the foundation of what they believed. So as the gospel begins to open up to other people, in Acts chapter 10, Peter goes, preaches to Cornelius' house. The, gospel, the, the, the Holy Ghost falls on Gentiles. They're baptized now in Jesus' name. And when this happens and the gospel begins to go into the Gentile community, there begins to be this argument that begins to take place among people. And the argument is, in a simple way to think about, is this. We were Jews and we came to know Christ. Do Gentiles have to become Jewish before Gentiles can know Christ? Makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, this is what the Jews did. And if Christ himself, if Jesus himself was a Jew, shouldn't I be Jewish in my pursuit of Jesus? And this argument begins to take place. And then people begin to wonder about it and people get, begin to ask questions about it. And they begin, there's this group of people that they become known as what are called Judaizers. And what Judaizers were, where they came preaching that you have to follow the law in order to have Christ. Now, Paul, who was as Jewish as they come, was a Pharisee, knew the law, honored the law, lived the law. Paul comes down on the other side of this thing and he says, no, 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 no. When God opened the door to Gentiles, you didn't have to go through Moses. Now you get to go straight to Jesus. And even to the Jewish community, he's saying to them, you get to go straight to Jesus. You get to skip the law and go straight to him. Now, let's be clear about something. There was nothing wrong with a person who was brought up in Judaism continuing to follow the law and follow Jesus. Those things were not at odds with each other, okay? What was at odds was a person converting and saying, now you have to be Jewish before you can follow Jesus. So verse 3, it says this, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. 
This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So he says, Titus came with me. And what Titus coming with him is kind of poking the bear. He brings a Greek with him. He brings a person that they would... Now, one thing you'll pick up on, the Bible talks a lot about circumcision. More than any of us talk about it in our daily lives. You're going to hear that word so much through the letter of Galatians. And you're going to be like, I think we heard that word once when the doctor asked if we wanted that for our son. And I wasn't even sure. Okay. So here it is. He says, look, I brought Titus with me. Titus wasn't circumcised, but I wanted him to come with me so that they could see that Christ was moving among the Gentiles. I brought Titus as exhibit A. Titus, you don't have to have that. Now, I'll tell you what's even more fascinating than this, and we'll get on to it later. But if you read into Acts chapter 16... Paul has another young protege with him. His name is Timothy. And Timothy, his mother is Jewish and his father is Greek. And to Timothy, Paul says, you have to be circumcised. And I can just imagine Timothy being like, but what about Titus? (laughs) Why me? To which Paul would say, you have to read it. I'm paraphrasing. Paul would say this essentially. Because you're going to a group of people and it's necessary in order to reach them. Let's be clear about some things that take place in ministry. There are certain restrictions that may be placed upon the life of the person who is seeking to minister so that they can be more effective in their ministry. That's not persecution and that's not legalism. That is an attempt to live out a life that is honoring to God to reach people. Paul said, listen, Timothy, Titus was going to Gentiles. The Gentiles don't care one bit whether or not you're circumcised. You, they know your father's Greek. We're going to Jewish communities. They better see you walking with a limp right after we get there. That's just all there is. You've got to understand that there's something being asked of you we do this in the church. We actually, we, we have ministries that we kind of, we, for lack of a better term, we guard them. And we say, hey, there's a restriction. There's some things we ask of you. There's things we ask not simply as a uniform. There's things we ask in lifestyle in order to engage in particular ministries. It doesn't make you better. It doesn't make you more spiritual. It simply says, this is what we ask of you. Because Timothy could have looked at Paul and said, nah, bro, I'm out. And Paul will said, that's fine. Paul would not have said, that's fine. But Paul would have said, okay, but you stay here. You're not going with me. You're not engaging with ministry with me. You can do what you're doing here, but you're not going there and doing it. Sometimes this happens in ministry that we say, listen, we love this. We honor this. We keep not the subwoofer, the platform. We do love the subwoofer, though. Um, we, we honor certain ministries. If you are in a, a ministry of where you are pouring out of yourself, if you are in a, in a ministry in which you are um, speaking and declaring the word of God, if you're in a position of teaching, we're going to ask more of you than if you open doors. We just, we, we, we simply are. It doesn't make you more spiritual than the person that opens the door, but it means that you are willingly, voluntarily subjecting yourself to a higher degree of consecration than somebody else. And we have ministries that we want, man, we want you to serve in them. I, I you know, I, I joke that if you want to be on the greeting team, then show up to church three times and wear clothes on the fourth Sunday, you can join the team. Brother Jeremy, who leads that team, doesn't like it when I say that. Uh, <laughs> but anyway... That, well, I want to preach. Well, bro, we got some things to talk about if you want to preach. I'd like to join the praise team. We got to talk about some things before you join the praise team. There's some lifestyle expectations. Titus, doesn't matter. You're, you're, you're attending to the Greek community. They're not concerned. Timothy, where you're going, we have a higher bar than Titus had to meet. And that's okay. So he says, look, Titus came with me. 
even though he was a Greek. And this matter arose because false believers infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ and to make us slaves. But we didn't give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel may be preserved for you. So what it is, there's these people coming into the Greek church, to the Gentile church, and they're saying, you have to take on the law. You have to observe Sabbath. You have to eat kosher. You have to go on down the list. You have to do all these things. And these Gentiles who love the message of Jesus go, whoa, 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 wait, what? And then you create these tears of Christianity, these tears of of believers. Again, nothing wrong with you living out this conviction. What's wrong is when you began to demand it of the Gentiles. So in Acts 15, there's this whole deliberation and there's this church council that comes together and they come back and they say, listen, look, it it seems good in the Holy Spirit to us. You know what? Circumcision isn't necessary, but if we're going to keep the peace between our communities, there's a few things that you need to, you know what? Let's not eat an animal with, let's not eat an animal's blood. Let's stay away from certain sexual perversions that, that, you know, that, or not certain sexual perversions. Let's stay away from sexual perversion. Okay. (laughs) They said, listen, there's some things, but we're going to have to keep the peace on this. But yeah, you know what? Keeping the law, circumcision, that we're not, we're not worrying. We're not worrying about those things. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. Although again, this is, this is Paul and his confidence and some would even say arrogance as for those who were held in high esteem, whoever, whoever they were, I forget their names. Whatever they were makes no difference to me. Again, I'm not going to do it because I did one good impersonation and I'll mess it up this time. But you can't help but read Paul with like almost like a, like a Trumpian kind of voice because there is just this high degree of arrogance almost with it. I want to do it, but I'm not going to do it. See, now there's pressure and I won't do it. It'll come out sounding like JFK or something and you'll be like, what was that? We'll see if I come back to it. He says, look, God doesn't show favoritism. They added nothing to me. I'm not concerned. Listen, if your concern with the church is just impressing the right people, man, there's only one person you got to impress. The only one that I'm here to impress is Jesus Christ. That's it. And so listen, I, I, don't care if I, I don't care if I impress you. I don't care if you like my jokes. I don't care if you like my teaching. What I want to do is I want to honor God, and I hope that you want to honor God right along with me. That's what I hope we're here for. And so if we're here today and you're trying to get anybody's attention, stop it. It's for him. It's for him. We worship and we play for an audience of one. I'm not concerned with impressing the right people. Guys, in ministry, we can get into this political game where I want to rise through the ranks and I want to go and I want to take this opportunity and that opportunity. I want to hold this. No, 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 no. I am not concerned. I'm not knocking anybody that does that stuff. But I am not concerned with how well I may be liked within my community of ministers. What I am concerned with is how much does God love me? And am I honoring him right Right here because this is my calling. This is my calling. You, this congregation, you are my calling. And my first calling before you is my family. I don't care if you like me. I'm concerned if he does. I'm concerned if she does. She likes me most days. He says, on the contrary, they recognize I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised just as Peter had been to the circumcised. There we are again. There's that word. They recognized that God had called me to the Gentile, and God had largely called Peter to the Jew. Now, Peter had to open that door. That's what Acts chapter 10 is. And this is one of the things that I find amazing about it. Paul is about as Jewish of a guy as you can find. And Jesus says, that's not where you're going. You're going over there. There was something about his testimony There was something about his education. There was something about his ability to communicate that God said, what you're going to be most effective at is reaching the people who are most unlike you. You ever consider the fact that maybe God hasn't called you to reach anybody that's like you? Do you know who my favorite people to witness to are? People like me. They look like me. They have the same interests as me. They enjoy the same movies. We can talk about things because they're like me. 
Do you know who I have a track record, a terrible track record with of bringing people to church? People like me. What if God, it's in the fact that you're opposite to someone, unlike someone, maybe that is part of what God has opened a door for you into a community to reach people who are completely unlike you. Oh, they would never be interested in what my church has. But would, would they? Do you know that? Because they're not anything like you. Maybe you don't have a clue. Maybe you just need to share the gospel. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me, an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So we parted ways after giving me the right hand of fellowship. They've accepted me as one of them, me and Barnabas as one of them. But we've gone our ways understanding that our ministries are going to look completely different from one another. You know, and I do believe there's men and women in this church. God has called you to communities that God has not called me to. God has called you to reach in the lives of people that God has not called me to reach. Because I won't have any influence there for whatever reason. But you just might. And then as we come together into this place and this church becomes a melting pot of culture, this church becomes a melting pot of color and language, as this church becomes a melting pot of educational backgrounds, that God begins to do glorious things because each of us is doing the work to reach the community that God has called us to. We are called collectively to reach this community of Northwest Arkansas, all right? But within this community are communities that you and I both well know some of us are going to have better luck with than others for whatever reason that is. For some reason, I personally cannot get 30-year-old white people to come to church. Can't do it. They're, not, they're probably already going to some church that's way cooler than this one anyway already. All right? So I begin to open my, God opened my eyes to the people that I can reach, the people that are unlike me. All that they asked, verse 10, was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that I had been eager to do all along. She said, okay, remember, and this is something, I was actually in discussion with this today with my mother-in-law. You do see this, and this isn't part of my notes, it just struck me. Um, you'll hear these arguments about people, well, the church exists for the poor. I'm not saying that the church doesn't exist for the poor, but one of the things that you will find largely in the Bible, that when there is ministry to the widow, to the orphan, to the poor, those are typically ministries to the community of widows, orphans, and poor within the church. And I'm not saying the church doesn't have a calling beyond its walls. I believe the church does. But if the church seeks to meet the needs of the community around them before it ever seeks, seeks to meet the needs of the people that go to church, kind of doing it wrong, I think. We need to be able to minister, and this is part of what the church does, and this is one of the things that I love about this church. I have seen people go through hard times, and I have seen other people make their way across the church to say, I heard there was a need. I want to help. And they have not, we didn't stand up and take up a big special offering. It was just individuals through the word of mouth of a community knew that there was a need, and they sought to meet the need. Guys, that's how the church needs to be. That's exactly how the church needs to be. We need to know that when there's an issue that you can pick up the phone, call your brother and sister in church, and if nothing else, you'll get a good ear to listen to you, but maybe you'll find help in your time of need. And if you're always needing help, you might need some other kinds of help, okay? Because I know, I know, I know that game too. Well, it's always the same person asking for help. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the genuine needs that take place in the lives of believers, so going on to verse 11, and this is where the passage gets kind of good and interesting. When Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is just another word, it's another name for Peter. Peter, who stood up on Pentecost. Peter, who said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Peter, to whom Jesus said, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Peter came, and Paul says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. This is the arrogance of Paul. This is the confidence of Paul. Now, I imagine this, like I told you last week a little bit, Peter was short. 
uh, he was a short guy. He was maybe in the range. They somewhere between like around five foot. Like so, he's short even by their standards for short people. They, he probably had, they, he, he was blind. He walked with a little bit of a hunch in his back. Did they say, I, I imagine that this is not a good looking guy. And then I imagine Peter. Peter the fisherman. Peter that chops ears off people. I imagine like this brawny dude and short little Peter, short little Paul comes up to him and confronts him. He says, look, I did it because he stood condemned before certain men came, for before certain, for before certain men came from James. He used to eat with Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So it, when they would gather for church, they would have a common meal. That's what they would do, much like we're going to do in a couple of weeks. We do that from time to time. He says, but what would happen is when we would have a common meal, Peter was just, man, he was just in the mix. He was with everybody. He was, he was hands on shoulders, smiling, shaking hands, kissing babies. It's just what he was doing. He was out there in the community. He had a plate full of bacon, just having a great time. But then some people from Jerusalem came. Now, whether or not James, the brother of Jesus, sent them, we don't know. But we do know James was the head of the church in Jerusalem at this time. When these men came, Peter stops hanging out at the Gentile tables. There was a tradition at that time. It wasn't necessarily law, but there was a tradition at the time that they wouldn't share a table with the Gentile because they didn't want the Gentile's food to contaminate the Jewish food that was kept under the law. But Peter had blown past that. I mean, Peter was the guy that received the revelation that Jesus said, hey, if I've called it clean, don't you dare call it common. I've opened this all up to you so you can have all this food. So Peter is the guy that received this revelation who preached the gospel to Cornelius that has been in the homes of Gentiles, that has eaten with Gentiles, that shared meals with them. And now those good Jewish brothers show up and Peter says, eh. And he just starts hanging out at the Jewish only table which shouldn't exist in the church. Amen. We should never have anything take place in this church in which we become segregated along lines like color. That's one of the things, things that I love, and, and I'm aware that this church is predominantly white, a white church, but one of the things that I love is that it doesn't feel that way to me. Now, it may feel that way. Somebody else may look around like, well... Well, let's get evangelistic, guys. <laughs> I want this church to reflect our community. I want this church to be full of Hispanic people, of African-American people, of Indian people, of Asian people. I want it to be full of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And then when we gather together, I don't want it to be a click like, well, okay, well, the Russians are over there, and the Filipino group is over there, and there's the Hispanic people that are over there, and then th these are our, our black saints over here. No, 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 no. I want it to be all mixed together. That's what it is meant to be in the kingdom of God. That's what it's meant to be. Oh, the rich people sit over here. No, 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 no. We don't play that game. You don't get priority because of what you give in the, in, in the box. You're not special just because you can throw a couple extra zeros on the end of a check. Jesus saw the widow give her last two mites and said she gave more than anybody in the building, y'all. So we, we, we can't begin to draw lines around ourselves and separate ourselves from other people thinking that one of us is superior to another. Ain't nobody in this room better than anybody else in this room. Not at all. And I don't ever want us to go to think otherwise. We are all, we are all made in the image of God. No more, no less than anybody else in the room. You're a child of God just the same as me, just the same as Brother Ron, just the same as Sister Aaron. You are a child of God, created in his image, loved by him. And when he bled on the cross, he had you in mind. And if you got problems with people because of their educational background, because of their financial background, because of the color of their skin, you need to get that right with Jesus. So Peter starts drawing lines in the church because some good Jewish people showed up and he didn't want to offend his Jewish brothers. The professionals showed up. He's mixing the friend group. I don't, we, don't, we don't do that. 
Right? If, you, if you have to think before an event takes place and you have to th- think to yourself, okay, well, it's going to be my church friends or my worldly friends, you better act the same in both places. You better dress the same in both places. Because if one of them is about to be shocked by the version of Braden that they're about to see, then you're doing it wrong. Be the same person always. Be the same person. Peter was not being the same person. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, Peter said, Paul says, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas is my boy. We went to Jerusalem together. And now he's acting a fool right over there with Peter. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, to Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Bro, I just saw you eating a pulled pork sandwich. Now you're telling my brother over here he's got to get circumcised? You can't do that. No, 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 no. When you accepted bacon, you left circumcision behind. And everybody said amen. Amen. Praise God for that. Thank you, Jesus. All right? Circumcision is not a litmus test for conversion for men. And all the men in the room said praise God. Anyway, it got personal in here real quick, and I'm sorry about that. But he calls him out to his face. He says, look, you don't even follow the law yourself, but now you're acting like you follow a law. He says, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because the works of the law, no one will be justified. Just look at these two guys on paper, Paul and Peter. If one of them was gonna be justified by the works of the law, it wasn't Peter. Paul was the Pharisee. Paul was a professional Jew. He was the guy that, was going to qualify on the basis of his works. So I'm pretty sure he said, look, you don't want to get into a contest with me. He says, look, we, we who are Jews by birth, we're not sinful Gentiles. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, there's this debate within the church. It's a debate that started back then. It's a debate that rages even still today. And the question is, what about works? Where do works fit in with my salvation? Because people will say, well, you have a works-based salvation and that's blasphemy. But we have to understand there are certain things that we do in our walk with God. We do not do things, certain things in our walk with God because it saves us. Okay? We do some things in our walk with God because we are saved. And there's a distinction. Now, on Pentecost, the people came to Peter and they said, what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So look, what are the, listen, right there, that plan that he lays out, that is not works-based salvation. That is obedience to the word of God. Repent. Repentance is something that takes place in our heart. It's not a, it turns into physical acts, but it takes place in the heart. Listen, you can stop committing the sin with your hand, but you can still entertain it with your mind. He says, you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin. Then you need to be baptized. You need to be baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, you're later on in Acts 15, they're going to find, they say, hey, stay away from this, stay away from, nobody looked at them and said, stay away from sexual immorality. That's works-based salvation. No, they said, because I'm saved, I'm staying away from sexually immoral sin things. Do we catch the difference in those things? Well, it's, it's like in our marriage. Well, that's just a works-based marriage. You can't view pornography. No, I don't view pornography because I love my wife. Right. Right. Amen. Well, you could do that and still be married. You can, but your marriage is going to suffer. 
Well, so we can play these games, but the Bible says, listen, what we're doing, what James tells us, faith without works is dead. I love, I can tell my wife I love her, but if I never express my love to her and I simply express my affections towards other things, is my wife going to feel very loved? No, because anybody who is married will tell you and they will happily tell you that a good marriage takes work. Has that ever stopped anybody? Well, I mean, yes, it has. Never mind. But has that stopped any of you good people from attempting to make good on your marriage because it's work? Now, it's no fun if the other partner's not working with you. Some people say you preach about the things that you're dealing with. Our marriage is good, all right? <laughs> our marriage our marriage is good. But this notion of a works-based salvation, again, we have to find this balance. I don't do it because it saves me. I do it because I'm saved. God said to the people of Israel, and then it was reiterated by the apostle, be ye holy for I am holy. There, 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 there's, a, there's a positional kind of holiness. I'm, I'm made holy by him. But then there's this facet of holiness that has to do with me striving that has nothing to do with my position. Okay? I could say, well, God has made me holy, so now everything I do is a holy act. Nope. That's not how it works. Certain things are still off limits for us. So he goes on to say, listen, Christ cannot... Christ. We are justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, because the works of the law, no one will be justified. And here's something that is very particular to this argument, and it comes up throughout Galatians. It's this. When he says the works of the law, he's quite literally talking about the 600 plus Levitical laws. Never mind the fact that there's no temple and there's no place to do sacrifice, and a good portion of the laws literally cannot be kept. Never mind that fact. They say, you've got to follow the Levitical laws law in order to be saved. You've got to keep the Sabbath. You've got to eat kosher. You've got to do things. I, you, you'll, there's actually a movement of people. I've talked about them before. They're called the Hebrew Roots Movement, that they are trying to place uh, basically those Hebrew roots of Christianity onto the modern church. They're trying to say you have to worship on Saturday, and you have to keep Sabbath, and you have to observe Passover, and you have to do all these things that Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. It's complete. I've sealed the deal. That's not necessary. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves to be among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? He's asking a question that's actually, it's kind of an important question. He says, look, we as Jews have regarded these Gentiles as very much less than. And now we associate with them. What does that mean about Christ's sacrifice? And he's saying, no, 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 you're, you're, you're missing the point. The point isn't how Jewish can you be. The point is how much like Jesus can you be. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. You know, Christ, we, he doesn't, Christ doesn't use, Jesus doesn't use the term of destroying the law. He talk, comes, talks about fulfilling the law. But he fulfilled the law, and when it was fulfilled, then you and I, our obligation to it has been fulfilled in him. Amen. Okay? Yes. And you read through the Old Testament, you read through Leviticus, you're going to find some very interesting laws, laws about cleanliness, laws about all kinds of wonderful things that... We have a few younger ones in here, so I won't go into it. All kinds of wonderful laws. But read through, and there's some interesting things that take place there. There are going to be laws that he says, this is an abomination. He says, this is an abomination to the Jews. Because you're Jewish, because I've separated you out from among the other people, and I don't want you to be like them. Don't do this. It's an abomination because you're Jews. Those sorts of things have passed away. There's other things where he says, this is an abomination to me. Listen, if it was an abomination to him then, it's an abomination to him now. 
okay? If it was an abomination to the Jews, we are not Jews. That distinction is no longer. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Paul says, look, I came up through the law, but I've died out to it. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Are we living our lives in such a way that we truly believe that Christ is alive in us? Let me ask you, because he says later, he says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the living God? If he's living in you, are you a satisfactory dwelling place? Not are you perfect, but are you striving? Are you seeking to obey him, to honor him? The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Listen, if I could achieve it all on my own, if I could check all the boxes, arrive at perfection, and then just turn it into the teacher's desk, I would have no need for the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. I don't set aside his grace. I walk in that grace every day of my life. I don't set it aside. I don't put it down. You know, the Bible tells us where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. And then he asked the question, so should we continue in sin? By all means, no. Because I've been given grace, I now try to honor the grace that has been poured out on me. You know, when we've been caught in our sin, whatever that might be, and we are offered forgiveness, and we are offered grace by a parent, by a friend, by a spouse, by an employer. If we're ever in that position, we have committed sin, we have missed the mark, we have acted foolishly, even stupidly, we've been caught in it. And now the other party, and I'm talking about this in our humanity, now the other party offers us forgiveness and offers us grace Many of us would hopefully not spit in the face of the person that just offered us grace and return to the acts that we were just committing. Many people do. Many people do. And many abusive relationships are kind of built off this continual return after grace is given. Guys, there comes a point when grace, 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 judgment. And there will come a day when judgment comes. It may not come in the here and now. It may not come in according to your timing and to your liking. But you know what? It also just might. Eventually, the employer is going to let you go. Eventually, the wife will file for divorce. Eventually, eventually something will take place. If I take the graces that have been given to me, and then I just act as if nothing took place. There's no repentance. There's no remorse. There's no change. I just use that grace as a license to go back to the thing that I was already doing. And so it is with Christ. Where were you when he found you? How were you when he found you? And let me ask you this. After having walked with him, whether you've been walking with him for six months or you've been walking with him for 60 years, years. Let me ask you, are you better off now than you were when he found you? Are you better off now honoring him with your time and talent and treasure? Were you better off now or were you better off back then? If you're better off now, why would you go back? Why would you walk backwards? I'm not, I'm not talking about mistakes. I'm not talking about stumbling. I, I'm, I'm not, again, sometimes we get so wrapped up in this, idea, like sin is a terrible idea, but also sin simply means this, to miss the mark. Guys, you're gonna, you're gonna stumble. 
But there is a chasm between aiming and missing and just going for the wrong target entirely. I'd rather you aim and miss. Aim and miss. But you know what? Keep aiming for the Word of God. Keep aiming for relationship with Him. Keep aiming for restoration. Keep aiming for reconciliation. Keep aiming for holiness. Keep aiming for justification. Keep aiming for Him. I don't care if you hit the target on the bullseye every single time. I don't care if you hit it on the border. But what are you aiming at? And I don't want to take cheap grace and throw it away and just aim at my own thing. Paul said, look, if I do that, then his sacrifice, wasted." In Hebrews, it talks about if you return to the law, it's like you crucify him again. And I think it's something interesting here because this is something, part of our struggle, and I'm wrapping up with this. Part of our struggle here. We're not a people that have ever lived under the law. Now, some of us might have experience with what we would consider to be legalistic or hyper-legalistic churches. That maybe, maybe that's the case, but take that, bad, take that bad day, that still ain't living under the law. But one of our issues so much isn't with legalism. The legalism is a problem in the church, and it, it can be a problem in the lives of believers, Legalism isn't so much our problem. You know what our problem tends to be? Excess. And when somebody comes along who has a conviction, do you know what we tend to do? We don't really want to listen to people with convictions. You know what? God has called people here to just, again, we, we live out the Word of God in a way that's distinct here. We teach on it from time to time. And if you've got questions about it, oh, man, I see a lot of ladies in this church that wear skirts. Why is that? I see a lot of ladies in the church. They don't seem to cut their hair. What's going on there? I want to know more of that. I'd love to tell you about it. But let me tell you this. Does that save them? No. Are they honoring God in their salvation? Yes. What saved them? I'll tell you what saved them. It was faith in Christ. And when they believed in him, they repented of their sins. They went down in the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. And they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues. They were justified in a moment. But right now we're in this moment of living out our salvation, working it out with fear and trembling. So there's the things we do and there's some distinctives about us. We do it to honor God. Not to twist God's arm. God, I'm committing to you. I'm sacrificing some things to you. I'm standing out from the world. I'm, being, I'm, I mean, I'm making an attempt to be holy as you have called me to be holy. There's things that we don't engage in. There's acts that we don't commit. There's places that we don't go. There's movies that we shouldn't watch. There's par- portions of culture that you and I, we just simply don't need to engage with. Because we want to honor God. You know what? It'll make you a little bit different from the world around you. But that's okay. But that's okay. So anyway, within this, I'm going long and I got off and, and I've got to land this plane now. If we're not careful, we'll get around a person who lives their life in a way and then we say, well, why do you do that? Here's a great example. I don't drink alcohol. If you serve in ministries in the church, we ask that you not engage in drinking alcohol. I think alcohol in large part is unwise, damaging to your body, and the mother of terrible decisions the world over. That's, I don't even think I need to go to the Bible to justify why I don't drink alcohol. We can go there later, but let's just say I think it's a bad idea, and that just is borne out socially, okay? But what's funny is when you don't drink, and you get around people that do drink, and then they begin to say things like, I wish you wouldn't judge me for drinking. Literally, the only thing I did was order a Dr. Pepper. but you're so judgmental. I said, Coke Zero, please. <laughs> Has anybody been around that, that kind of engagement with somebody? Where they, where they say, well, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm just, I'm just trying to honor God in the way that I think I need to honor God. For me, I'm just trying to avoid alcoholism that I saw destroy my uncle's life. Again, I don't even need scripture for me to stay away from it. But if we're not careful, we do this in the church. We get around people and then we say, well, they're judging me. Are they judging you? Did they tell you they judged you? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? 
And let's be honest, some of you have felt that way. I've felt that way around people. You know, I'll get around somebody like, my wife and I, we watched this show on Netflix last night, and then they'll be like, we don't have a TV. And I'm like, what was a great show? I'll record it for you, and you can listen to it on the radio. I don't, I don't know what to say. We, we can do this thing, but let's be very careful. When somebody talks to us, and, and whether they speak their conviction or we see their conviction, let's be careful that we don't assume they're judging us when maybe they're just honoring God. Yeah. Brought it to a super awkward close tonight. I'm aware of that, and part of me is like, I could go like 13 more minutes and try. No, we're just going to shut it down tonight. We're going to pick up in Galatians chapter 3 uh, next week, and uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why y'all love me, right? <laughs> if, I, if I wrote books, people would be like, is that a cliffhanger? I don't Got very mixed feelings about what happened with the narrative, with the narrative there. All that to say, I love you guys. And if you ever have questions, I'm open. I've said it before, I love questions. Questions don't scare me. Questions don't scare Jesus. I love questions. You'll never ask a dumb question and you'll never ask an offensive question, ever. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I thank you for these wonderful people that have so much grace towards me. God, I thank you for them, Lord, that, God, that you just planted me with people that love my slightly offbeat sense of humor and my inability to end sermon well. And God, I pray that you would just bless us tonight, God, each and every one. Lord, every man and woman, God, every child in class, God, our children, our teens, uh, those that were able to make it to Redfield for camp, I just pray blessings, God, wherever we are geographically. Lord, and I just pray that you would overshadow us tonight, God, with your love, with your mercy, God. Draw us closer to you, God. Not that we would seek God to justify ourselves, but we would seek God to honor you in everything that we do in all of our lifestyles. God, I pray your blessings upon us all. Bring us again Sunday morning in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. See y'all at Sunday morning at 930 and 1115. And if any of y'all like to sleep in a little bit, we have a little bit of extra room at the 1115 service if anybody wants to check that one out.